I invite you to remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. Today we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, in the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace compared, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Before we get started this morning in, uh, in delivering the message, I do want to mention one thing that I failed to do in the announcements, which I promised Amy I would do this morning. And that is this. If you have been visiting with us for a while and you might be interested in joining our church, perhaps you know you want to join the church or, or you're just considering or contemplating joining the church, if you would like to, then would you uh, see Amy? You can either find her or email her or call her. All of her contact information should be in the bulletin as well. But if you will catch up with Amy, she will certainly help to connect you. And for that matter, if you would like to perhaps sit down with me and have a cup of coffee or meet, um, I am more than happy to do that to answer any questions that you may have or any concerns or interest that you may have about our church and our ministries. So this morning I want to begin by telling you that there were two men who were at work and it was relatively early in the morning and they were sitting around the coffee pot and, and one guy just had this real look of doom and gloom on his face, just really mopey. And so his friend says to him, he says, say, you, uh, you look rather depressed. Uh, what is it that's got you so down? Ah, my future, his friend replied. Well, what makes your future look so hopeless, the first man asked. My past, he said. Don't you wish you could be a fly on the wall for the rest of that conversation? I'd like to know what regrets this man has in his past that were stealing away his hope for the future. Some time ago, there was a particularly sad letter in the Billy Graham uh, newspaper column, and someone wrote this. They wrote, I'm all alone now, and I'm up into my 80s. I know it's my own fault. I was mean and rude and hard with everybody in my whole life, and now my family has turned against me. Maybe someone will learn from my life. I wish that I could live it again. One of our greatest fears is reaching a ripe old age and looking back at your life with nothing but regrets. Reverend Graham was compassionate in his answer, but he was truthful as he wrote, one of life's hardest lessons is that we cannot change the past. Louisa Tarkenton spoke for many people when she wrote, I wish that there were some wonderful place called the land of beginning again, uh, where all of our past mistakes and heartaches and all of our poor selfish grief could be dropped like a shabby old coat at the door, never to be picked up again. So let's take a moment and let's talk about regret. Regret is the crippling emotion because it leaves us chained to the past. Regret provides the ammunition for the twin demons of shame and guilt. 
It erodes our self-esteem. It's the little voice that whispers in our ear, remember your failures. Remember your foolish decisions. Remember the kind of person that you were. The Apostle Paul, though, of all people, he understood the corrosive power of regret. As a devoted Pharisee, Paul, then called Saul, was the chief prosecutor of the early church and the early Christians. And in the book of Acts, chapter 7, we read of the execution of the young martyr Stephen, who was arrested and ultimately stoned to death because he preached so boldly about his faith in Jesus Christ. So in chapter 7, verse 58, it says, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And then in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was there giving approval of his death. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, Saul. Saul most certainly knew what it was to have regrets. In Acts chapter 9, he has a life-changing experience, that encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and afterwards it changes Paul. It changes everything about him. And then when he tries to join up with the other Christians, well, as you might imagine, they were reluctant to receive him at first. How could they know that he was truly a changed man? How could they be sure? And so Paul goes away for a little while, a time of discipleship, and when he returns, he is ready to take on the mantle of leadership, and Paul becomes the most effective evangelist in all of Christian history. Oh, yeah. Paul knew what it was to have regrets, but he also knows the indisputable power of Christ to change a person from the inside out. He knows the power that can change a man from a murderer to a minister. Also, Paul is not afraid to be honest in his letter to the Ephesians. In verses 1 and 2, he says, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in all of those who were disobedient. You were dead, he says. How is that for brutal honesty? Not just, well, you messed up, or you were morally challenged, or well, you were failing to self-actualize. No, no, no. He says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Let's not kid ourselves about the fate uh, before we came to know Christ. Let's not kid ourselves about the direction of our lives or the fate of our souls before we came to know Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just come to help us to reach our potential or to become nicer people. No, no, no. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. Paul is not reminding the Ephesian believers of their past to, uh, to shame them. In fact, he sympathizes with them when he says in verse 3, all of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, by nature, he says, we were deserving of wrath. All of us once lived like that. We all were in the same boat. None of us is better than the next. So what do we do then? What do we do with our past? What do we do with our fears and our failings and our foolish decisions? What do we do with the accusing voice which is always whispering in our ear and imprinting in our heads? Paul is only reminding us of the past so that we can rejoice all the more in the present. And so he goes on to write, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace, 
that you have been saved. And God raised up Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We were dead, but now we are alive. And not just barely that, 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 uh, that breathing on life support kind of life. No, no. He made us alive in Christ. What does Jesus say about his kind of life? In the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, you remember? I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus doesn't come to give us our old lives back. He comes to give us new life. He comes to give us abundant life. And that life only hints at the glorious riches of the heavenly treasures that he has stored up for his followers. On September the 12th, Janelle Guzman McMillan became the last person to be rescued from the rubble of the Twin Towers in New York City. No one understands how she was lucky enough to survive when over 2,800 people who were in the buildings at the same time as her all perished. And, and, and so a, a piece on survivors like Janelle, a reporter of Time Magazine wrote, having cheated death, they aren't certain how to live. What do you do when you are supposed to die, but instead you live? How do you go about shaping a new life? A lot of war veterans deal with this very thing, the thing they call survivor's guilt. But before the attacks of the World Trade Center, Janelle was living with her boyfriend, Roger, she cared a lot about her appearance and going out with her friends to nightclubs and dance parties. And occasionally she and Roger would attend church for yeah, special occasions. But they had entered the stage of their life where they had began questioning if work in nightclubs was all there is to life. But while she was trapped in the rubble for 26 hours, she says that she prayed fervently to God. And she knows, she says, that he saved her. And after her release from the hospital, she and Roger were married. And they attend church regularly now. Janelle hasn't returned to work yet. She spends most of her time reading her Bible and watching religious programming on television. Her friends and family worry about her. But none of them can deny the strength and the power and the peace that she has from her newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Her priorities have changed. She believes that God saved her for a reason, and she reads her Bible fervently in order to discover what that reason is. I think verses 8 through 10 in our scripture today answer this question. They answer the question for the Ephesian believers. They answer the question for Janelle. And they answer the question for us. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We didn't deserve to be saved. We didn't earn new life. It was given to us, the unselfish gift that comes from the hands of a loving and faithful father. Verse 1 of this passage tells us that we were dead. And then verse 5 tells us that we are alive. 
And then verse 10 gives us the reason why, and it is to do good works, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love uh, our brother Larry or Gideon who was here today. I was jotting the note down when you, when you spoke, and uh, he says when, when he saves us, he saves us to something. Y'all remember when he said that? He saves us to something. He doesn't save us to sit on the sidelines. I thought, well, how fitting is that for today's scripture passage? So what do we do with our newfound life? We dedicate it to doing good works, not just hit or miss charity kind of things, but good works as a way of life. In 1999, best-selling author Stephen King was hit by a car while he was walking near his home. The accident left him with severe injuries. And in an article in Family Circle magazine that came out November 1st, 2001, King writes that having a close brush with death taught him to contemplate the real meaning of life. And as he writes, he says, I want you to consider making your life one long gift to others. And why not? All that we have is on loan anyway. All that lasts, he says, is what you pass on. Giving isn't about receiving the gift, but the giver. It's for the giver. He goes on to say, one doesn't open one's wallet to improve the world, although it's surely nice when that happens. One does it to improve one's self. I give because it is the only concrete way that I know of of saying that I am glad to be alive. Listen to that quote again. I give because it is the only concrete way of knowing how to say that I am glad to be alive. Who would have thought lessons from Stephen King? Let me ask you a question today. Are you glad to be alive? Are you grateful for the grace and the mercy that God has shown to you? Do you remember where you were before Christ saved you? Don't let that overwhelming sense of of gratitude go to waste. Allow it to motivate you to live in a life on purpose, devoted to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and doing good works for him and for our neighbors. Pass on the love and the mercy that God gave you. As Stephen King wrote, consider making your life one long gift to others. It's what our Savior did for us and is what we are called to do for others. In her memoirs, which she published in 1997 at the age of 98, Jessica Lee Brown shares advice that she has come to understand about living in hard times. She says, you say that you think life is like a big puzzle. How right you are, my dear. Life is like a puzzle, and the pieces fall into place every day. And then the giant puzzle lasts all along life's way. God will, if we ask him, she says, give us strength for whatever may come. So let's put guilt and confusion behind us. Once we ask and we are forgiven, we can start a new day with joy and accept the fact that we are all sinners saved by grace. And then we can have a cheerful smile to light up our face to greet anyone that we meet at any time and any place, she concludes. Let me ask you a question today, brothers and sisters. Can you put guilt and confusion behind you? Can you start a new day with that kind of joy? You can if you accept that we are all sinners saved by grace. We are not made to live in the past. And Lord knows, I know, and you know, so many of us have experienced it. It can be haunting. It can be crippling even. But we aren't made to live like that. We aren't made to live in the past chained by our regrets. We're made to live an abundant life in fellowship with God 
and in service to our neighbors. Let's start living as people who are truly alive today. We can and we will if we accept and we embrace these teachings in this word from the Lord today. The question is, will we walk out of this sanctuary today still chained by the burdens of the past and of regret? Or will we lay it at the foot of the cross, bow before the Savior and say, all that I have and all that I am is yours, O God. Take me, cleanse me, make me whole, and let me look forward to a new day in faithfulness to you, Lord, and in service to all of those that you put and direct into my life. Sounds, that sounds like the way I believe I will commit myself to this day. Will you? Let us pray. Lord, our God, hear our prayer as we open our heart before you this day. Lord, we ask that you would encourage us and that you would nurture us and that you would bring us to where you want us to be. Lord, we pray that you unlock the burden from the past and you allow us to embrace who we are here, now, today, in you, because of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.